Hey, thank you for tuning in and choosing the Entrepreneur Next Door podcast. Uh, my name is Zev Ash. I'm your host. And it's my pleasure to welcome Jamal Marshall to this episode. Jamal, you know how to do this. You're a podcaster. I'm going to have to perform today. Um, just give me about a, give me about a minute or so of who you are. A minute or so of who I am. So I am a counselor, certified counselor, and also a podcast host myself. Uh, my business is Listen and Speak LLC. And for me, it's not just a brand in my business, it's my life. Uh, it's something that I work really hard to practice, um, obviously in conversation and communication and work, also in conflict resolution, because that happens. And uh, I actually counsel the coaches. <laughs> so there's a lot of coaches that have ha hatched out the wazoo <laughs> since COVID, uh, but they need a counselor. Uh, they need a therapist. And I also work with HR managers and recruiters and mid-level managers. Uh, many times in business, these are the people who get the brunt from the board, the C-suite, and everybody below. And the mental health is at an all-time low, and it's high turnover. So instead of going in as a consultant, I like to go in to actually deal with the root of what the mental belief systems are between turnover um, and between team miscommunication. So love what I do, and really good at it. So that's why I am. All right. So that was a handful. We'll unpack it slowly. Let's go. Um, my day job is a business coach, so I'm intrigued that coaches come to you, but we'll talk about that uh, later. Uh, and you can you can do a live therapy session with me. I'm, I'm open for it. Let's go. Um, <clears throat> all right. So I spend a good few hours, as I always do with my guests, digging into their background, watching their stuff, uh, picking things that intrigue me, things... I have some basic questions that I want to ask you, but then it's going to be free flowing and really uh, it's good. It's like podcasting improv for me. Like the, the question I asked often come from some of the answers you give as, as opposed to prepared stuff. But let's start with, here's your quote. I want to take as many people on that journey as possible. What is that journey, Jamal? What are we talking about? Man, I, you hear a lot today, especially in business, about EQ. That's a big thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I think training and emotional intelligence uh, certainly is valid. But most of us are not self-aware. And we don't realize unwittingly we give ourselves away by the things that we say and the actions that we take. Uh, no matter what you say, no matter what you write, especially in our very digital age of social media, your outstanding patterns are always indicative of what you believe. So taking them on the journey of what exactly do you believe? What is at the core of who you are? And how do we deal with the core of that belief to actually set you up for real success? Even if you're crushing it, a lot of people are crushing it, making six figures or even seven, seven figures, but they're being crushed on the inside because they haven't dealt with the thing that actually causes them to stay in a cycle of showing up in a way that's not just less than stellar, but showing up as a trauma response. So even those people that say, hey, I'm a type A, I'm a businessman, I really get it done. Their whole business is a trauma response. And they're actually breaking people in the path to becoming so successful. There's a different path to take. And so that's the place I want to take everyone with me. Let's go on that path to self-awareness and actually give you the why behind your what. Because most people, even at different aging groups, don't really understand why they do what they do. Beautiful. So now we, now that we set this up, I'm going to jump into a time machine dial it back to your teenage years and i bump into you and ask jamal what do you want to be when you grow up what's the answer i will tell you as a teenager i want to be a prosecuting attorney <laughs> <clears throat> and i'm so glad you didn't become another lawyer so that's a beautiful thing uh, <laughs> but why was that do you remember what what was the driving motivation behind that if obviously it wasn't motivating enough because you're not but what what was that it's weird. Uh, being a, a kiddo, I, I heard it from a lot of people. And so the you, you'll hear it said, depending on what circles you, you walk in, the words are spirit. The more you hear something, you actually start believing it. And that belief can become inculcated. And I was like, well, maybe I should be. Um, I was a, a, a chill, you know, teenager, kiddo. But I, when it came to a debate, if you didn't have your receipts, I could turn you into a pretzel. And so I think a lot of people felt like, oh, you make a really good prosecuting attorney. And I always like to research a matter, always been a bit of a thinker, especially to a fault. And so it's like, well, what facts are you presenting uh, in this debate or in this argument? And so 
I think that gave people around me the, the data to kind of feel like maybe he should be a prosecuting attorney, but it wasn't something I was passionate about. It's it's interesting because uh, it, from from the way you describe yourself, it sounds like oh he could rip somebody on the stand and you know break up everything they they lied about or said about. But I just watched snippets of the trial in South Carolina, um, and watched. It was interesting because the the defendant was a highly successful trial attorney. Uh, the guy that was accused of killing his wife and his son, and then the, the watching him on the stand, which people rarely, if ever, take the stand when they're accused of anything. So now you have an attorney, prosecutor, cross-examining a witness who is also a very skilled attorney, trial attorney. And it was really fascinating to watch the dynamics uh, between them. But um, it isn't about the gift of gab, right? It's about, uh, it's really connecting the dots when it comes to legal, but let's not, let's not waste time about attorneys and legal stuff. Um, so <laughs> you want to be a prosecutor and attorney, and then you wind up getting a, uh, a BS in counseling psychology. So there was well, something changed, right? Yeah. Going back to that, I'd actually taken a, uh, I live in Washington, D.C., and I'd actually taken a class called DC Street Law, which was actually pretty intense. So they actually, we did a whole mock trial in a courtroom uh, right in downtown DC in Judiciary Square. And I actually won best prosecuting attorney for that. Believe it or not, I was about 17 years old. But my prosecution was actually, my my uh, my client was actually guilty. And so I actually won for a client that was guilty. And for me, my faith is really important to me. So I couldn't take that as a, a profession to say, I just want to win this case. Meanwhile, my client is guilty and the person on the defense is in, in shambles because it's like, man, they they actually had a case going and I just was that good in my argument. Um, so I knew in faith that that's not a profession I could enter <laughs> um, for me personally. Um, now, fast forward. Um, for a, a long period of my life, I dealt with a lot of childhood trauma. Um, and we, we can't go all the way into it in the time we have here, but my dad, who before he passed, was my best friend uh, in the early years, was my worst enemy. Uh, he was a alcoholic and a drug addict. So my first thousand dollars that was saved up for me in the bank, uh, he actually used and smoked crack. So that was stolen from me by my own father. Um, he was also very abusive, not sexually at all, but uh, physically and verbally. So I grew up in a lot of fear but I also had a very tender heart. Um, so you would imagine that I played the surrogate spouse and surrogate father for my sibling <laughs> and, and my mother. Um, so always knowing how to receive issues and come up with solutions that were practical and applicable seemed to come natural to me. Um, and when I was, I would say in my maybe 16, 17 through 19, I would keep getting the theme of a lot of people who are older than me, I mean, significantly older, would bring me their issues. And I found a way to actually give them solutions to it. So folks said, you ever thought about becoming a counselor? I, I initially gone to college for computer graphics. I hated the schedule. I mean, the classes were all over the place. You'd have one class at 11. The next one wouldn't be so 3 p.m. And I'm like, I'm not staying on campus this long. So I switched to general studies knocked all of that out. And then I start taking classes in psychology before I transferred to university uh, in uh, Southern Virginia. And um, I loved it. I loved the study of the mind, the study of human behavior. Uh, a lot of it came very natural to me. Some of it I thought was hogwash, I'm just to be honest. Um, but I realized that throughout the theme of my life, I it was weird as a youngster, I had friends that were my, associates that were my age, but my closest friends were like in their late 40s in mid 40s. So I was always a bit of an old soul. Um, and I really found ways like people solve problems like through IT, I solve problems with people, and was really good at it. Um, you know, the degree was just my paper, in a sense, uh, rendering the Caesar with a Caesars to say, hey, I'm qualified now to do this. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's kind of the, it was weird how that happened. Um, but I started actually listening to see like, what am I actually really good at? And what do I want to do? So you get the BS in, in counseling psychology. Mm -hmm. Your 
so is and if my timeline is off you can correct me but no, you're your, fine. your first job was working for the federal bureau of prisons mm -hmm. now was that by choice or was that meaning you had options to go somewhere else but you picked that yeah my first job happened right when i got into college um and i knew for me i always had the goal of not taking out any student loans um, there's a scripture that says, oh, no, man, nothing but to love him. So I said, OK, we're just going to do this thing. You, me, I'm not borrowing anything from my parents. I'm just going to do it. And so I, I did my first two years at PG, Prince George's County Community College. And I started, I didn't know what my major was, so I hadn't declared. And the job that was offered to me uh, was a job as a, a student worker at first um, in the government. And it actually paid really well. So as as an intern at first. I was making, uh, this was 2003. I was making nearly $40,000, <laughs> which was, which was not bad for a college kid. Um, you know, and, and then I, I moved up GSs. Um, and the strange thing is that they train you to then to go into, you know, you co-op and then you move into the absolute, you know, full-time, you know, with all the benefits. Um, so working at the Bureau of Prisons, you know, as a counseling and, psycho and counseling and psychology being my major, ultimately, I wanted to go into the prisons as a DTS, which is a drug treatment specialist. Um, and it sounds really weird, but I wanted to get every inmate off psychotropic meds. Well, first thing that's illegal, folks, <laughs> whoever's <laughs> listening to this podcast, you don't do that. <laughs> and I didn't learn until later years when I got certified in counseling, you never tell someone to get off their meds. <laughs> um, Something happened with my paperwork where it came too late, you know, to the higher ups to transition me to a co-op and I had graduated out of my position. So I, I had gone to the highest I could go. Um, and it was just so strange because they were like, man, it's it's paperwork. We, it's nothing we can do to like to keep you. And so I had to leave the Federal Bureau of Prisons. And it was strange. I had a, a whole going away. The whole di the director of the not our building, but the whole United States Federal Bureau of Prisons came to my going away. That was actually really slick. I was like, wow, who knew little old me could have that much of an impact? So when I had to leave there, um, for the better part of four months, I didn't work. And I knew that, okay, I, I want to work. I want to start, you know, getting into what my major is and what I love to do. But there are some issues, you know, with my own childhood that I knew needed to be resolved. It's like, Jamal, before you help people, you need some help yourself. Let's actually be honest here. And that's when I actually took the time to go away uh, to the Midwest to actually invest in my own mental health and wellness. So for seven months, <laughs> I actually was seeing a counselor um, and then I did an internship. Uh, and so my first internship for seven other months on the heels of that was actually being a website quality control person and then doing like prison ministry. So going into prison. So I actually ended up back in prison, <laughs> but in a different capacity. And then 2013, from 2011, I started training, you know, for counseling to, to build up to the certification. But 2013 was when I actually became a counselor. So. So what's interesting is your your certification is IABC, which is the International Association of Biblical Counselors. Yes, sir, it is. So. I don't know what that means. I mean, I can guess. I'll flesh why, out for you. What does it have to be? What has to be a biblical counselor, counselor as opposed to a counselor? Uh, it's very much the funny thing is one of the books that I, I use is Steve Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Uh, one uses, of the best books. Yeah, best books ever. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> he uses biblical principles. And so that's not something I shy away from. You know, in today's council culture, it's like most people have no idea the very things they use for their success come straight from the Bible. I said it and I'm not taking it back, folks. <laughs> so, um, those principles, principles found in Proverbs, principles found in Ecclesiastes, they're all throughout. They're some of the most successful principles and tools you can use. And you'll hear me if you've listened to my podcast, you've seen me live, especially if you're sitting in a session, I'll quote Proverbs a lot. That's the book of wisdom. Um, and so I love using these tools, but I think when people see that word, they think, well, we're just here praying. <laughs> no, we, you know, as a counselor, part of my certification was hours of clinical studies, you know, and I'm not a clinician. And so, you know, in the caseload I've had, I've had to refer uh, and work tandem with a clinician if I have someone who's on psychotropic meds, because I'm not going to tell you get off your medication. I'm going to work with your doctor. 
and we'll work over time to see, you know, what your balance is, what your levels are. Um, so the very same thing psychologists study, we study. I just use a different set of principles to make myself more well-rounded. So, I mean, this is a entrepreneurship pod podcast. You're an entrepreneur because you're you're you work for yourself. You're a counselor. Um, you you say I'm not a coach, and we'll distinguish the two quickly. Um, but in terms of your your target audience, when uh, when you label yourself as a biblical counselor, do you, do you find that maybe sometimes it's intimidating to people who are not? I, I get your point, right? Mm -hmm. you, you're using biblical principles of behavior and faith and con and and how to conduct yourself. Uh, it part of your counseling, but do you find that sometimes this could actually be intimidating or turn off someone said, oh, wait, 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 I'm not religious. I don't want to do this thing. I find that anyone who's followed my content knows that I'm not religious either. I have a relationship with a higher being through Christ, but no, I'm, I'm not religious. <laughs> I actually don't like religion myself. Uh, there's a scripture that says the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And for anyone who may be turned off by that, that's not who I'm supposed to reach. There's even a scripture, I think, in the book of Revelations that says, he who has an ear, let him hear. If you don't have the ears, then it's not for you to hear. And that's not my concern. If it, you talk it, to everyone, you talk to no one. And if there's people who say, well, I don't want to hear that because that's a part of that's a part of his profile, I'm not for you. And I'm OK with that because there's eight billion people on the planet that I'm OK with. So you use an interesting term that I happen to use also. Um, I'm not religious. Right. And. I'll tell you what I mean when I say it, and you can explain what it means when you say it. When I say it, and I, I'm Jewish, so when I say to somebody I'm not religious, is I don't believe in the in the ceremonial BS that goes along with religion, including even though I raise kids as going to, to to temple, including the the organized religion of having to go to a building for the sole purpose from my perspective is to somebody to take your money and and spend it and make you feel mm -hmm. guilty if you don't right um so to me the religious part is yeah i'm not into the ceremonial ritual nonsense that it, in my religion which is probably the same as yours the origins five six thousand years whatever it was okay don't care uh there are parts of judaism that that I believe in and adopted to, but have nothing to do with rituals. Your turn. You're not religious, meaning? Yeah, I don't think I have to go into the brick and mortar of four walls to celebrate my faith um, and to tap into what I believe to get myself settled and centered. Um, and I, I refuse to be guilted into giving anything. Uh, there's even a scripture that says, don't give begrudgingly. You know, I give what I purpose in my heart to give so it can have the impact it's going to have. And if I don't, then I don't. Um, I believe you should discern. There's uh, there's a verse in First John that says you you have God's spirit, so no man should to teach you. Um, and I think when you get into religion, it can be very cultish, where you end up being led and you don't think for yourself. Um, I believe you research and search a matter out and, and think for yourself. And I think when you get into keeping rules, uh, many times the way our human behavior works is like I've been a good little boy or a good little girl, and now I can do whatever I want. The the inverse of that happens and you swing for a polar opposite and you may end up committing some crimes that you didn't intend or didn't envision you would. So yeah. that's how the letter kills folks. Um, and it manifests itself many different ways. So no, I'm not religious and I thank God I'm not. So I'm going to quote you again. You say that what we believe about ourselves is hardwired through often a traumatic event. Um, and you share that, at least in your own personal experience, that's something that you went through, and then it impacts you. And then if you're lucky, and is in your case, you actually recognize the impact of that traumatic event head on you, and then you go fix it, which most people tend to suppress it or not go there, right? And they wind up carrying it. And I, I thought it was interesting that you said that because somebody who is who I know very, very well, very close to me, said to me about five, six months ago, uh, going through a traumatic experience, said, I have come to realize because this happened, 
that I spend my entire life making everyone else happy. I never once considered what happiness means to you, to me or what it's going to take for me to be happy. Um, and I know that person really, really well. Um, and it was heartbreaking to hear it. Somebody who is in their early 30s, super, super talented, amazing person. Um, and I think that when you say um, you help people find their role, right, as you define it, I think, right? Mm -hmm. uh, are we talking happiness as in role? What else is involved? I would change that word just for me. Um, and that's a great question, by the way, Zev. Uh, happiness, I think, is a construct. Fulfillment, I think, is something that I aim for uh, because happiness can kind of come and go with whatever your mood is or your attitude. Fulfillment is what the purpose is. What were you born? What were you here to do? Um, I, I can be on a on a yacht, on a boat with shrimp and lobster and say, oh, I'm happy right now. Uh, yeah, that's cute. It's quaint. But fulfilled, what is my purpose here? Why, why am I here for this time? And we waste a lot of time based on sometimes the, our response to the traumatic events of our life. And like you said about your friend, I know what that's like. I live for years, half of my life, you know, with that fear of rejection that came from the, the verbal and the physical abuse, you know, I learned to function in a way where no one will reject me. So straight A's, you know, um, before I had a back injury, I was semi-athletic. You know, I knew how to be excellent at everything. And so that fed me, you know, it's our hunger that drives us for those who are listening. And I was hungry for the affirmation. What I wasn't getting at home from my father, I was hungry to get everywhere else. And mm -hmm. so it manifests itself in being an overachiever. In many ways, I went overboard in things. And there were times I even felt tired, like physically. And it's like, why am I tired? I, I felt like I had a good night's sleep because my mind was going at a thousand when it should have been going 50 miles per hour. I was always overthinking, trying to stay a step ahead of everyone else around me. And that's not living, folks. That's existing. Um, and even in your business, for those who are entrepreneurs, uh, whether you're a manager or whether you are a coach yourself, you find yourself overthinking because your fear, you live in traffic and terror. Uh, and if there's a traumatic event attached to that and you've not gotten into the weeds of that and actually dealt with it, that's going to color the way you live your life. You can't two extra time and 10 extra business until you actually deal with it. And you can avoid it. You can go for years and avoid it and then look back with the ghost of time standing in front of you and realize how much time you wasted and how many opportunities you didn't go after because you had a fear of perceived rejection. The very thing you fear, um, a lot of times it's the, the rejection so much itself is not as scary as our perceived outcome of what may happen, you know, if we take a certain move. And so just going back to answer your question, man, I can deal with clients right at the root, because I spent years, actually months and then years, you know, dealing with my own root um, and actually seeing it for what it is. I didn't like jump on LinkedIn and get like some three week certification and dub myself a coach. <laughs> I literally had to actually do a lot of the mind work. And the mind is a battlefield. There's a war in the mind for territory. And so reclaiming that territory takes time and it takes being both proactive and intentional, but you won't regret it. Yeah, I'm, as you're speaking, and I don't remember who it was, but um, someone that I listened to, and I think he wrote a book, was referring to what happens inside, so our, our thought process, uh, that when you let that control you, you're in prison. Back to sort of analogy to some, some where you've been hanging out. Uh, you're actually in prison, and, and to be able to control the little voices in your head and control the things that are sucking you into a certain path um that's literally when you finally master your ability to to take over you are literally liberating yourself you're getting out of prison um and it, it's a concept that was actually very interesting to me because it's true right you are you're you're confined. You you can't get out. You don't know anything else except what's in there. And I actually had my guest, and you know Chris Hennessy, uh, right? And I he was on my podcast. He was scheduled to be released two months from now, but he celebrated, you know, the end of parole. And I wanted to release his podcast. And and he was talking about the impact that prison had on him. The, mm -hmm. 
not having the liberties and the freedom. And that's very similar to when your thought process controls you and it's not a positive thought process, right? No. And that's, oh man, I love that. The, the fact is that I think a lot of times based on personality or at least the outward way we project our personality, you know, people think that this is just for that, that, that type B, that super soft-spoken uh, young, young man or young lady. And this is not for that head of company, not for that CEO. Uh, many times the people who come across the most bold are the most fearful. That is your life jacket that you think keeps you from drowning. It's like, I'm going to eat them before they eat me. And you feel like you're in control because you have put fear into the hearts of other people to keep them oppressed and to, to corral them. But you are very much controlled and you still live in a prison of your own mind. Mm -hmm. And the, the other thing you mentioned, um, use, the, the, use the word purpose. And, and that's so the word passion, which I really dislike and I can't stand it. And I don't use it. And people that use it, I just tell them to stop because it's so beat up and overused. Uh, you know, my passion in life is, I mean, who cares? Okay. It's not your passion and it's, it's the purpose, right? And at the end of the day, uh, when, when I was in teaching in graduate school, I used to tell my students, here's a, here's a great exercise for you to do. And this was about entrepreneurship and leadership. At the end of each day, when you brush your teeth, you, you stand in front of the mirror in the bathroom alone and you brush your teeth. Here's your opportunity to ask two, two simple questions. Just you and you, right? It's mano a mano. First question, have I been productive today? Second question, did I make a difference in someone else's life? Done. If the answer is yes and yes, put a big smile on your face, go to sleep. If the answer is no and yes, a yes or no, whatever it is, the piece that is a no, try to think quickly about what can you do tomorrow to fix it? What can you do to improve, right? Um, and, and it's sort of like the, the connection with the purpose in this simple exercise, but it's powerful, is, is, is back to purpose, right? Have I been productive today? Have I made a difference in someone else's life? Ultimately, I think those two things, it's sort of what distinguishes us as human beings. Would you agree? I would definitely agree. Yeah. And so um, what's, what's interesting, all right, so let, let me jump into this. Quote, I'm not a coach, I'm a counselor. Why? So I'm a coach. Um, part of my coaching very often, because I work with, with business owners and, and their team, very often is counseling, but not your, it's, I guess it's unlicensed counseling, but you make that distinction. Tell me why. Yeah, and it, it there are so many different types of coaches, I think, especially in my genre. Um, Wow. <laughs> it's all right. So in, in my genre, I would make the distinction of there are a lot of people who call themselves like a, a, a mental health coach. <laughs> um, so like a financial coach or a business coach is very much, they have a purpose uh, with you and they're very in the moment and forward. The same way with mental health coaches, it's just like, I'm just here in the moment with you and looking forward. Us counselors, actually, we're going back you know, um, but we need to actually go back in a way that's healthy. You know, I, I tell my clients, if you go too deep, too fast, you might drown. And being very sensitive to where they are and sensitive to what the need is. If you take someone to a place where they snowball, you're not serving your client well. And you're actually impressing on them what you think is helpful for them. The biggest thing is listening, doing some client clarity. And then you get a tenor of like, this is what they need in this moment. Then you move in the present. Then you move forward. You know, where coaches mental health coaches, quote unquote, just kind of go forward in the present. It's like, and a lot of times, <laughs> most people are needing to deal with why they're showing up in the present the way they are. So that's where I come in. So what's the difference between a mental, mental health coach and a counselor? I could get into legal differences. Let's just no, say no, like no. If someone's a licensed therapist, you know, obviously they have a a board and different people they answer to is certain things that they cannot even do within their practice. Mm. Um, certified counselor, we have a little bit more freedom um, versus a coach. They have a lot more freedom and a lot less to answer to. Now I'm, I can certify in coaching. You know, I, I believe it's nothing wrong with that, but I also want to level up from coaching. You know, I've been counseling for years. 
Um, coaching kind of gives you some methods, you know, to really deal with the present part of your client. Um, and most, you know, most counselors are coaches themselves, but I, I tell people, you know, like I'm not, cause I think the word coach, especially since COVID, I could tell them I'm not one of those COVID coaches. Everybody's a coach now. I'm like, yeah, some of us, we're not new to this. We true to this. <laughs> I'm not new to this at all. I've been doing this for, for years. I'm good at what I do. Yeah. It's interesting because I mean, for me as a, as a business coach, um, I started 11 years ago and didn't know anything about coaching. And, but there was a, I, I came into it at the, at the end of the 2008 recession and unbeknownst to me, everyone that's ever been laid off became a coach. That was like the in thing to do. Oh, I'm, I'm a coach. Why? I look at my resume. I'm a coach. Um, not everyone can coach and not everyone should coach. And, right. as a, and what happened is, as I found the hard way, um, all these people ruin it for the for for those of us who are good at what we do, mm. because they they burnt enough people on that on that concept that when somebody came across me and said, "What do you do?" Well, I'm a business coach. Ah, no, no, been there, done that. That was a waste of money. Didn't like it, right? So so that's a new. The same thing can happen, like what you said, like post COVID. Same idea. People were out of work. Uh, a lot of people wanted to be entrepreneurs because so what should i do well i'm really good at talking to people maybe i'll be a counselor <laughs> you know it's it, it's it's not that easy but they do it right and the certification piece jamal which is kind of interesting um i don't know if you're familiar with rich litvin but he's somebody that that's a, a coach for specifically high performing uh people but he also coaches coaches who mm -hmm. coach high performing people um Really an incredible, incredible person, human being. Um, and and he, he very often would say that your clients don't really give a crap about your certification. That's not what's going to get you a client. It's, it's more about your ability to connect with that person at an intimate, deep level. That's it. And, right? And that's the piece that's missing, even in my world, um, now I won't talk about what I do because I, I I don't go there. But in my in in the world of coaching, this I think this is what coaching and counseling maybe have something in common, is that if you cannot connect on a deep personal intimate level with your client, you are never going to be effective. And, Mind drop. Right, because. The truth. Even though if you want to hire me to help you grow your business, if it's stuck or it's doing well and you don't know what else to do, uh, the expectations are that your experience of what you know, you can put things in place, tangible things that are going to get you there, right? Um, my style is I don't even get to that piece. My first piece is I want to get to know you. Who are you as a business owner? Uh, because your mindset and the culture that you created around your company are the single most important piece of what's going to drive this company forward as opposed to either template or solutions that we might implement to get you growing, right? So I can grow anything, but I can't do one single thing for a company that has toxic culture with, with an owner who's an egomaniac, narcissistic, thinks he's smart than anybody else. And everybody that works for him is just to help, right? Uh, who couldn't care less about their future, their lifestyle, nothing, right? Couldn't do anything for that guy or woman. And by the way, I'm pretty good at assessing people. I wouldn't even work with them anyway. So, right, th this is the piece where I think there's a, there's a good overlap, uh, the ability to connect with the person that you're there to serve. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm right there with you, man. We're on one accord with that. Yeah, if you don't right. have that connection, especially dealing with the mind, either that person's not your ideal client, or you're in the wrong profession as a counselor. <laughs> now, as a counselor, I can coach, and I, I do coach, and I, I'm good at it. But I'm also going back. I'm not just staying in the present and going forward because sometimes you have to, especially uh, dealing with the clientele that are coming to me. So, so you define what you do is I help coaches and managers. Forget the managers for now. I help coaches achieve maximum productivity by tackling burnout, 
codependency, and people pleasing. Mm -hmm. Break it down. Well, burnout, I think, kind of speaks for itself. Yeah, yeah, um, break down. Um, yeah, that's that's going to be pretty easy. Um, many times, especially with coaches, it's hard to 10x the business because a lot of us like control, especially if you fear rejection. And so it's hard, it's hard to do what? To delegate, <laughs> to say, where do I hand this piece of the business off? And why am I holding on to it? Why have I not handed it off? You know, do I fear the unknown? Do I fear the outcomes? You know, have I not developed systems and processes for this yet? You know, and why am I not actually scheduling into my own calendar vacation time, pockets of downtime, you know? Now, those of us, I, I know you talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, and if you talk to an entrepreneur that's a solopreneur or somebody like me who where all the financial weight sits with them, they have to grind at a different level. Mm -hmm. I know we see a lot of stuff on LinkedIn where everybody's saying, oh, I just sat in a tub for eight days. It's like, okay, be honest, sir or madam. You are a three-time divorcee with alimony coming in out the wazoo. <laughs> and so, of course, you don't have a sense of urgency. Let's just keep it, buck, keep it a buck. As you can see, I'm very direct. Mm -hmm. uh, but for a person who has got a practice, they burn out because their fear of rejection even has them taking on more clients than they can handle. And they've not delegated, you know, or they don't know even on a personal front how to say no on home front. They've not established boundaries. And so that's going to definitely lead to burnout across different, you know, areas of their life. Uh, codependency, um, many times, especially in the counseling realm or in the coaching realm, if you, you want to connect with your client, but you don't want to overconnect, you know, remember it's our hunger that drives us. Is your connection with that person feeding something in you that could be unhealthy? Um, now, a lot of times you got to think in the way I'm talking, some people are probably listening right now. Oh, that's not me. Well, I'm not interacting with that, you know, which is why most of my clients are the lurkers. They're not these people who are going to leave a comment on your post because who wants to acknowledge these things? Kind of embarrassing if you think so on social media. Mm -hmm. But we know, you know, like I say at the end of some of my videos, like, listen, I may not know specifically who you are, but you know who you are <laughs> and you know where to find me. Um, and so with the codependency, and it also can manifest itself if we have a traumatic event, it can connect us to people in our life whose season is up. Um, and if that person's season is up and they're more of a drain on you, they're more of a weight than a wing, you not have to learn how to break that connection in a way that's redemptive and not destructive, not burning a bridge, but making sure that bridge that is built is no longer in your lane so that you actually find your lane, both personally and professionally. Now, the people pleasing, my goodness, um, that goes back, especially to the trauma. Um, and I, I should know as a, a recovered people pleaser, with the trauma I dealt with telling you earlier, I didn't want anyone to reject me. So everything was excellent. I even had the head of the math department in my statistics class. She was the head of the department. She said, you are an overachiever. And it wasn't a compliment. <laughs> She was saying, I need you. You've already graduated, dude. You're actually still trying to turn in assignments. You got the A. Get your cap and gown and get across that aisle. Um, it was to the point where in so many parts of my life, I was overworked. I was overexerted. I was overgiving because the, the thing I feared most was rejection. And it colored the way I showed up as a professional. I didn't say no to projects. I took things that were far over my scope. Um, and I didn't know how to take things you know, people, you, you hear about imposter syndrome so much, it's almost lost its weight. But that colored a lot of my interactions. You know, it's like, I had to begin to get into the mindset of like, why do I think that person is more qualified than I am? Because I fear that if I take that step, there's going to be rejection. Now I'm in the space of, you know what, if not me, who? If not now, when? You know? Yeah. You know, speaking of imposter syndrome, because it's a very interesting concept for people who are not familiar with what that means is that you get to a level of success and then for whatever reason, there are good reasons for it or not good re or reasons, you begin to doubt whether you deserve to actually do the work you do. Like, uh, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm an imposter and I, and I kind of, I didn't study it, but I see that a lot and thought about it a lot. And I think, um, and I've gone through some of it myself. And I think one of the reasons why that exists, Jamal, and can agree or disagree is that the the celebrity coaches the celebrity entrepreneurs the people that have massive exposure on social media and they're everywhere you see so much of that 
and then you look at it and say, but, well, look at Gary V. Look at this one. Look at this one. Well, I, I'm not, I'm not that. So I'm not entitled to do what I do. And we could do the same thing. Or at a small scale where you and I hang out on LinkedIn and you talk to someone and you look at their followers and you say, well, I have 8,000. Look, they have 40,000. They do what I do. I must be doing, either I must be doing something wrong or I'm not, I'm doing what I'm doing, but I'm actually a failure because I'm not that person. So I think some of this imposter thing is the self-doubt that is created for us, but this, this overexposure to these people. And you know, I, you know how I solved it? I, I disconnected from all these things. I Some people that I followed, I unfollowed them. I removed them. I don't want to see their crap because it didn't have a good impact on me. And if it's if it's not someone that I can learn from and all I see all day is their crap, I get rid of it. Okay. It's for me, not interested. I you look, know, I'm I'm a no one, I'm a nobody, like I'm gonna say like you, but we're not celebrities. And I live in the trenches. That's my my universe is in the trenches, you know, like I'm the street smart guy. Uh, I'm not interested in being invited to speak at TED uh, or go to a national association in Vegas and get on a stage in front of 400 people. That's not who I am, and that's not who I want to be, even though I can teach them a thing or two about business or marketing. But that's not that's not me, right? So do you see what I'm saying? It's like the imposter syndrome, I think, is generated by what we're exposed to all day, by people who can afford they have teams of social media people that expose them. But it doesn't make us bad people, you know. Like, yeah, and that's where just to kind of piggyback on what you're saying, I think that's where perspective comes in. Now, mind you, I'm gonna be honest with everyone in your audience. I got one F in my whole life, and it was during one semester. It didn't it wasn't my final grade, but I got one F and it was in geometry. I just couldn't figure it out. It's actually fun when you figure it out. Geometry is fun. But I just, it was my second semester and I just could not figure it out. Uh, I managed to bring that up to two Bs and my final grade was, I think, a C. Uh, but perspective is huge. And when I think about perspective, I would encourage, and I know this is going to sound a little morbid to your listeners, visit a graveyard. That'll give you a lot of perspective about where all this is going. And yep. also visit, if you can, a nursing home. I know it's a little harder now, you know, post-COVID in the era we live in. Um, we all, I'm going to be very graphic here. We all piss, poop, shower, and shave. I don't care who you are. And if you're not showering and save, shaving, your wife or a significant other or closest neighbor wishes that you did. So with perspective, um, that has a way of tackling imposter syndrome. It's not that we don't deal with it in seasons, but the way to counteract that is to bring perspective. That person is a human being, just like I'm a human being. And they have access to certain things in whatever season of their life that I, in this season, may not have access to. And I don't, uh, there's a scripture in Corinthians that says they compare themselves amongst themselves and they weren't wise. I don't have to compare myself against what I perceive. The reality is that they don't have something that I don't have. And if whatever my purpose is, I need to stay in my lane to fulfill my purpose. Maybe I'm not to do that. Now, for me, I've been contacted by Ted to do a TED Talk. And I am a public speaker, so I don't mind going on the stage. I can speak in front of thousands and I'm really good at it. Mm -hmm. However, I don't need to compare myself with another speaker because they're not called to do what I'm called to do. We've all been given a unique fingerprint. Each and every last 8 billion of us has a fingerprint that only we own. No one can do Jamal Marshall like I do Jamal Marshall. I, I love the um, the word you use, perspective, and, and the nursing home analogy uh, example, particularly because... Um, I experienced for myself when when I had to go through the it's not trauma but really painful process of moving my parents to initially assisted living and then to a nursing home and and I remember visiting them and the first time they were there they were vibrant and the people around literally three months later I come into the place I was lucky enough to go visit them frequently um, and you see this this amazing transformation of someone that walked into a nursing home three months ago vibrant three months later there's a complete difference they're not walking with the same energy they're it, it's pretty scary and then the deterioration 
continues and maybe it's psychological some of it is physical whatever it is and um it's really hard to see when you see your parent go through it it's it's heartbreaking and so you fast forward and i come back to work and i have a team meeting every friday with my team and and we talk about different things and everybody is bitching and complaining it's like you know, oh the phones are ringing you know every time we put the phone down the phone rings again and the emails won't stop ringing it there's so much stuff coming in and i said to them and i remember saying it to them and i said when i came back i said let me give you a piece of advice tomorrow's saturday do yourself a favor or do it any way you want there's plenty of nursing homes locally just go take a walk go to a nursing home walk to the front door take a big deep breath and and a giant whiff of the urine smell that will hit you when you walk in there mm -hmm. and then walk around the hallways if you can in most places you can take a peek or see the people that are sitting there and then come back and say thank god i'm alive this is the coming attraction so stop complaining you have a job you have income you have a family you have a friend you woke up this morning and go make the best of it right so the perspective piece that you were talking about um is is brilliant and you know i kind of i i always often use another word jamal which is humility right mm, yes have, have the humility to recognize that like you said right you're a human being and no matter who you interact with they poop and they pee and they well do the same thing right <laughs> nothing special you make it if you want to be special make it special but at the end of the day it's not about titles it's not about you know whatever your summaries are on linkedin or oh, yeah you decorate yourself no it's it's about you and it's fine so i have one more question that i wanted to ask you uh maybe it's maybe i don't want to say it's a stupid question because i know what you're going to tell me but um not everyone has a traumatic event in their life right right and so, but there are people without traumatic events that wind up as your clients too. So uh, how do we explain the difference? Because the core of what we talked about with you today was there are things that happen in your, in history that impact you. And it's important for you to recognize, realize, and address it, right? Mm -hmm. But what if, what if I didn't have a traumatic event? Yeah, I would say you don't have to be a traumatic, uh, uh, to have a traumatic past to qualify uh, as my client, but we all take subliminal hits mentally that we don't even realize. Many are unbeknownst to us. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way we're informed will inform what we believe. And what we believe will inform how we act and the choices and decisions that we make. Mm -hmm. And so it may not be a traumatic event, but a series of events that have stockpiled, a series of things said to you, done to you, a series of places that you've been or things that you've seen or ways you've processed information that has stockpiled. And it's still, I don't like to use the word stuck. You see that word with a lot of mental health coaches and they don't define it. it it's very ambiguous, but you, yeah. there's a quicksand of your own making. You've made yourself a glass ceiling. You operate and you traffic in fear. You haven't been able to save any time. There's no clarity of your own thought. You don't even know why you show up the way you do. And yeah. your business is suffering as a result. Uh, and your personal life is suffering as a result, no matter what you put on social media. And so you may not have had one, one huge traumatic event, but a series of events that have stockpiled, that have actually weighed you down. Um, and I, I love when I ask certain, you know, I'll ask clients, oh, why do you want to work with me? you know, during a clarity call, or why did you work with me? And they say, well, I, I tried better help, or I tried this person that was three times a doctorate, and then I found you, someone who could actually get to the root of what I was dealing with, so. Interesting. I mean, to, to, to what we discuss, I'm, I'm, and I'm sh sharing about myself, um, I grew up in, in, in a really happy childhood. I had an amazing mother, uh, Hardworking father, but amazing mother, spoiled rotten. There was nothing. There was nothing bad about my my upbringing in my childhood. I was a happy child. 
I also happen to be an only child. And my mother died when I was two weeks old. My biological mother passed away two weeks after I was born. And the woman that wind up being my mother or somebody, it's the story for another day, uh, but she just randomly showed up in Israel, heard about this tragedy. Something drove her to go meet my dad and look at the baby. She took one look at me and said, can I stay and take care of him? Right. That was, that was the mother that I knew. And she always said to me, I loved you more than a mother loves her child. And I never understood what she meant. But as, as I got older and I found out what, what happened with my biological mother, I understood that what she was meant, what she was saying. Because I'm not your biological mother, I went above and beyond to make sure that I don't do anything that a mother wouldn't be doing, right? Hmm. So, but the point of my story is happy childhood, amazing mother that raised me, good life. There was no trauma, but there was one. And I recognize it much later in life that being an only child and having all the attention on me all the time um did did it was traumatic and i never never acknowledged it because i didn't have any reason to acknowledge it so we say trauma we typically associate it with something negative right abuse mm -hmm. whatever this was a different thing it, it was it was a great life but it was so radically different because all eyes were on me everything was for me i was living a security of of this is my family this is my life and I recognized it when I finished my, my military service. There was a part of me that said, this is not the way things should be. So I chose to live my country, Israel, and come to the U.S. and go to school and be on my own to prove to myself that I didn't, I could function without the cocoon that I was living in for, eight, for 18 years, right? So my point is, we we talked about trauma that that sort of impact your path in life, but sometimes it doesn't have to be trauma is in bed. It could be, as in my case, something that has a significant impact on how you feel and how you think and how you behave mm -hmm. that you don't recognize it. So, um, all right, time for some rapid fire questions to Jamal. One word answers. If you say something that blows me away, we, it might be more than one word, but it's okay. One person influenced you the most? Jesus Christ. All right. Best advice you've ever received? Knowledge speaks, but wisdom listens. If you had a billboard in Times Square in New York City, what would you put on it? He did what he could. <laughs> one book that changed your life? The Bible. I I guess that one. <laughs> um all right. Less less serious question. What song would you admit to secretly singing in the shower? I hope you dance by Leanne Womack. <laughs> okay. All right, Jamal. This was fun. Uh I, I'm I'm glad we were able to dig deeper into who you are so that people get to know you. Um, you are an entrepreneur and, and look, coaching, counseling for anybody that listens sounds really sexy and cool, but it's not an easy profession. No. And, and part of the paranoia that we all go through when we have clients, uh, is the things that you said initially, the, uh, not the codependency, but the, the chasing of pleasing people, the burnout. The, the thing about coaching is that at any moment, a coach, a, a client can drop out. And when they drop out, that goes the income that that client represents. I mean, we still have to make a living and that's what we decided to do. Mm -hmm. And if you are really busy as a successful counselor, as I've been, you have little or no time to market yourself, to create the kind of, uh, pipeline of potential clients in the event somebody drops out, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so this is the challenge that we face all the time in the things that we do. Is that it's just that 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 push and pull thing. 
I love what I do. I have clients in the back of our mind, both that guy, that woman can drop off tomorrow for whatever reason. And then I have to go scramble, look for a new one. And then if you start from scratch, you can't really start from scratch and look for clients. You know, the, the, perfect, the perfect world in, in our universe is the clients find us. Because as a coach, as a counselor, to go around, market yourself and chase potential clients, it's brutal. It's frustrating. Uh, and, and that's how you end up not sleeping at night and de being depressed and having all kinds of different thoughts about why am I doing this? Uh, right. But yeah. so just want to put it in perspective that, you know, to, to some extent, you do God's work because you help people maybe rediscover their purpose or realign their purpose, deal with something that they haven't dealt with and gives them a much better clear path towards their future. Uh, in my universe, it's really not that different because to me, a business owner is still a human being. And the way they think, they act, very much influences how the company operates, how their employees are, and how the experience that clients get or customers get from whatever service or product they have. So, but it's more tangible. Your stuff is much more intimate and raw. And, you know, I, I commend you for doing that kind of work because for many, of, for many people, they didn't even know they needed, it, right? Yeah, that's the thing. When you function in, in ways that are primarily qualitative, people have to know that they need it, you know? And yeah. so I have to create content to engender trust. So that people see like, okay, that's the guy I want to work with. Yeah. And that's typically how it happens. Yeah. And it's, like and, it's and it's hard work. I mean, I, I mean, uh, I see your stuff on LinkedIn and, um, you know, the, the person that, you know, absolutely loves Zinab and you know, Zinab um, and, and, but I'm also finding that there's so many good people that I interact in and, you know, our community of the Zenab, Irit, Chris, or, you know, and I love being part of the community, but at the same time, I can't spend all day on LinkedIn commenting on stuff. It's just, cause no, we got to work. We got to work. <laughs> you know? I'll actually be on a, a comical post about that today. <laughs> You'll see you later today. <laughs> all right. So then I'm going to create another GIF for you. Cause that's what I learned from Zenab. Awesome. So, all right, Jamal, this was fun. We'll stay in touch. Uh, if you want to find Jamal on LinkedIn, it will be in my my relatively brief show notes. I don't transcribe the entire podcast, uh, not because I'm lazy. It's because I don't want people to read it. I want them to listen and or watch. Um, so, but it will be there. Look for Jamal uh, Marshall. There's only one of you. There's only one on LinkedIn. <laughs> There's only one of you. So, uh, good luck. All right, my friend. We'll stay in touch. Thank you so Rest much. Peace. Bye. <laughs>